right, guys, can we start? Good boy, he's a good boy. That's a good boy. So I've been given the topic of basic first aid to give you guys, and obviously we've got people that are very, very, very proficient, and I gather people that haven't had a huge amount of experience. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go from the basic to the most, well, the sort of the most serious. Um, basically, first aid needs to just be that first aid. Um, you can't do any major stuff. Um, you know that you need to just basically get the animal well to take back to your clinic or to wherever it needs to go. Okay. Um, so what I thought of doing is just going through the whole thing. I know everybody always asks me, the first question I get asked is, how do you do the Heimlich maneuver on a dog? <laughs> and I normally say Andiaz. But there are, there, there are documentations that it does work. Um, but before you do anything like that, you need to be very aware that signs that dogs show can be very confusing to you. Because a dog that is, is choking could, could be showing you signs that he's got a, a bone stuck in his tooth. Or um, a dog that has been stung by a bee can look like he's choking. So it really is important for you to assess the dog and not get yourself into a panic. Okay? So William, my boy here, is going to be a very good demonstration because if my dog is doing anything towards its face, uh, so clawing its face, um, they, they wrap their tongues inside their mouths, um, they, get, they, they start obviously choking and those kind of things, the first thing you would have to do is actually open the mouth. You'd have to look because the first sign, if, this, if your mucous membranes and tongue were slightly blue, then you know there's some kind of problem with the airways. Né? Um, if they're nice and pink and doing okay at this stage, you've got a few minutes or a few seconds to see what's going on before you have to get yourself into a blind panic. Okay? Um, and obviously, little things like just ordinary um, bones stuck on teeth would be mainly these teeth at the back over here are going to be the teeth that you're going to be worried about. Um, I know often those little um, bones that you get, like a lamb chop bone or one of those things, they often sit over the teeth like that, and that will really look like a dog that's choking big time when, when, when that happens, okay? Um, so obviously by just opening his mouth, you're going to see just these teeth, these molars at the back. But then if you'll notice, when I open his mouth like such, do you see how he pulls his tongue, goes right back into the back of the throat? And you're not going to see down that throat at all, okay? So the only way you're going to see down that throat is to actually do what your doctor does with a nice little wooden um, spatula. You're going to do that with your fingers, okay? So you will have to, I'm sorry, my boy, this is a whole pain, eh? <laughs> you will have to do one of those, and then you actually have to put your finger like that on his tongue to look down. <laughs> Boops, nothing there, boy. He's a good boy. Because the... You often get um, pieces of gristle there. Um, we've seen people with, um, that playing with small rubber balls. The dog grabs it and it sits here and it can't actually get it back. Okay? So those are the kind of things you're going to be looking for before you do anything else. Okay? Um, please understand that most dogs will be in a panic. Okay? And they're not all as nice as William, so be careful. Okay? It, <laughs> it really is something that you need to watch carefully. Then before you have to worry about um, a dog that can't breathe or is struggling breathing, sorry, my boy, stand nicely, just look and see how their ribs are moving. Because if he's managing to breathe, okay, easily, then you don't have to worry about his airways. But if he's trying to, to, to really ga gasp, and what will happen when they gasp, you'll see his ribs will be really trying to be extended out. His abdomen will be hugely tucked in and they almost bend over like that while they're trying to get air in. Okay, now, you probably find like a, the most serious thing would be a little food pellet being breathed into the trachea. Um, and that's really, really, apparently occurs quite often, but it is, it is a really, really bad thing because it's incredibly difficult to get that out. Okay, um, and obviously with a dog coughing, they'll try and get it out themselves. So once you've done all of that, and now you still think that the dog has got something in his trachea, not in his esophagus, okay? Because remember, if you, if you look at the anatomy, um, there the trachea goes, you can feel the rings of the trachea, and the esophagus goes just next to it. 
If he swallows something that's really big, it will also irritate his trachea. Okay, but it's on the way to the stomach and it's not going to stop him breathing. So you also have to be very uh, aware of that. Our little Maltese poodle type dogs, <laughs> they swallow that little piece of gristle off a, a, um, a chicken bone and it sits there and it really does look like they can't breathe but all they're trying to do is swallow and get it down um, into their stomach. Okay. So basically what happens with the Heimlich maneuver is your, your first thing is that you would put your hands from above, okay, so I'm not going to take William off the table again, but you basically put them together and you would push the abdomen as far into the, into the, into the chest space as possible. So you're doing exactly like a human except that you're doing it from the bottom to the top like such. They reckon with small breed dogs you actually lie them on their right hand side okay that their head is lower than their body and you do exactly the same but you wouldn't use so much force because remember you've got your liver sitting here you've got your spleen sitting here you've got your stomach sitting here please don't start to rupture your dog's spleen and everything like that, that to try and get out whatever it's trying to get out but it, it has it is successful occasionally um, but Unfortunately, with us, with our animals, we often, it's too late, and you, there's actually very little that you guys can do, okay? Have you seen everybody all of a sudden, William? <laughs> Silly boy. So, then, then let's just go to the, to the proper CPR. Do you understand that with, with, with Dinkum CPR, that you're giving them cardiac massages? If you do it too soon, there's a very good chance you're actually going to hurt the dog more than necessary. So before you do CPR on any animal, you have to make sure they're vital signs. Okay, so obviously, um, if a dog is breathing, you almost guaranteed its heart's beating. Okay, so um, if you do CPR on a dog, its heart's beating, then you're going to really injure it because you are con you are compressing this chest to a third of its its space. Hey? So you can really damage lungs, you break ribs, you do everything else. But if you really are going to be doing just one more second, my boy. CPR is important for you to feel their pulse at the back here. You know the femoral pulse that's inside their back leg? Okay. You need to be able to put four fingers inside their back leg. You'll feel their femoral artery going down the inside of their leg. And you hold your hand on there. Okay. And you can actually feel that heartbeat pumping through there, and if there's a heartbeat pumping through there, you're going to finish now, my boy. Um, you know that that heart is still going, okay? Obviously, feeling the chest on a greyhound is quite easy, because you can actually see his heart pumping from here. But um, on a normal dog, if you just put both your hands on either side of their chest, you will feel that heart beating. Um, and if that heart's beating, you don't do CPR, you would just do resuscitation, you just breathe for them. So let's just go through the normal just breathing for them. On a small breed dog, you actually wouldn't close their mouth. Because remember, when you're breathing into their nose and, and it goes down into their lungs, if you put anything more than 20 millimeters of mercury pressure into those lungs, you're going to start breaking the alveoli. You're going you're to damage the lungs hugely. Okay? So what you would do is you would hold, you would put your fingers, I'm not going to do it properly, boy, and then you would blow into his nose. But with a small breed dog, you would leave the mouth open, that some of the air would go into the lungs, and some of the air would still come out of the mouth. If you've got a dog that's probably William size and up, then you would close the mouth, and then you would breathe straight into his nose. So that's the one that you're actually doing physically blowing into his nose. And remember, <coughs> look, at, look at his chest when he actually breathes. How much movement is there? There's not a huge amount of movement. So when people try and resuscitate animals, you mustn't get huge movement. Because if you start getting huge movement, you're actually damaging those lungs. Okay, so that really is important to remember. And then the other way to get a dog to be, um, just to do the breathing, or that you would actually push his ribs in. And by doing that, the elasticity draws air in through their mouth or their nose. So you're actually doing a normal chest compression to be able to get the dog um, air into his lungs. You're not hitting him on his heart, you're just doing a, a normal chest compression. Okay. And then proper CPR, you would lie a dog. You want to lie down, my boy? Come, come on. Come on. <laughs> you don't really want to. Eh? You would always lie a dog on their right-hand side. Come on, friend. <laughs> Come on, William, there's a good boy. There you go. So you'd always lie them on their right-hand side. There's a good boy. 
Can you go on your right hand side, my boy? Ach, Belinz, won't you help me, please? He's a good boy. Here you go. Good girl. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. See? I got you. She said she was going to ask me questions, and I got her first. <laughs> you mind bringing his legs this side? Just bring his legs towards us. Lie down, my boy. No, lie down. Good boy. Lie down. Good boy. Good boy. So from your side, you're going to be standing here. Okay? And you're going to be putting the dog on his right-hand side, and you'll be using compressions over his heart. <coughs> and the easiest thing for you to do is put your hands flat and the other hand on top of it. And you may think it sounds easy, but uh, it is absolutely exhausting trying to do it. What we normally will do um, is we actually climb on the table, okay, and then you start doing compressions from the top. So before you start doing compressions, you need to know how often does a dog breathe and how quickly does his heart beat. So a large breed dog, their heartbeat is going to be anything from 60 upwards, and a small breed dog is up to 40. That's per minute, eh? So your, obviously your small animals, the heart beats much faster than large breed dogs. So you're going to be doing 100 compressions per minute to try and get this chest or this heart going. If you're alone, they still reckon that you don't have to do any breathing for the animal because your compressions on your chest are compressing enough with the elasticity, as I said to you just now, you will be breathing air out on this dog and he will be, or well, the, the, the lungs themselves will be re-inflating re, re, re just naturally, okay? Um, the idea of doing it, you should be compressing the chest to a third of its normal thing. But I can just make you very, very aware, this is an incredibly, I won't say a dangerous procedure, but you have to understand that animals that have had CPR on them, they have massive big problems with their lungs and everything else afterwards. Um, especially if they've had um, their hearts actually stop completely for a few seconds or a few minutes, <coughs> the blood will be obviously be clotting inside their bodies and you're trying to move that blood around. Um, but it really is important for you to start as soon as possible. As a general rule, they reckon um, after 10 minutes, if it isn't, the heart isn't going again, you need to stop, okay? Um, because from then on, there will be severe brain damage and nothing else will be going. And what would happen if Belinda was helping me here, she would constantly be feeling his femoral pulse, because if the heart's beating, it's no good if it's not beating strong enough to push the blood through to the, to the hind quarters, okay? Um, your dog will be in shock then. You know when you feel dog's ears and their feet and everything else, um, that will be ice cold. Extremities should be ice cold if they are in shock. Um, so that will be another thing that you'll be able to understand is that the blood will just pool in the vital organs and that's what you really want them to do. Okay. So um, it's not a fun thing to do, I can guarantee you that. Um, but it's something that I'm sure one or two you will have to do in your, in your careers, but it's just something that you have to do with, with caution. Um, when you're dealing with cats, you'll just do it towards a small dog, okay, as easy as possible. The only thing you have to be very, very careful with cats is um, where their larynx is, okay, you guys that intubate cats know that if you touch it, it goes into a spasm, you get a laryngeal spasm, and the trachea actually just closes from the inside. And then the cat's breathing against its own body and actually can't breathe the air in. Okay, so with the cat, try your hardest to understand. Do not put your fingers down its throat because if you touch that larynx, it goes into a spasm. And I, I'm telling you now, you actually get a forceps to push it open to try and get a tube in there to try and get the cat to breathe again. Um, it is a really important thing to do. And I, I know Sura will tell you that it's very difficult to get a cat fingers down a cat's mouth if it's if it's um, in a panic. Okay. All right. Now, you woken up, my boy. Come on. You must wake up. So then I'll gather the... <laughs> you, you silly boy. Thanks very much, Auntie. Okay. Do you want... Um, should I do the... I'll do the bandages as now. I'll call you up again. You see? You've almost. You've almost. So then um, another thing that you guys would, would see that will be at home um, and maybe in your townships, I gather, um, is something like bloat, um, gastric torsion. Remember, bloat is just theoretically the stomach filling up with excess gas, okay? The symptoms that you're going to be seeing is it's unbelievable. Your dog will start to try and vomit, um, and they're incredibly uncomfortable. They don't settle. 
they pace around, they're vomiting, they're moving around, and within a few minutes of you seeing those first signs, you will start seeing, you saw his indentation there, you'll start seeing a soccer ball developing in their stomach, okay? Um, it's also very difficult for you to, obviously at home, to know if that is um, an actual gastric torsion. And remember, torsion means the stomach's actually torsed, it's actually twisted, um, whereas a bloat is just excess gas there for some reason, either they've got garbage disease <coughs> or they're about to have a, a, a torsion. Unfortunately for anybody at home, well, there's no first aid for that. Eh? First aid is you get it to your vet as soon as possible. Um, it is. It is... Uh, it's a syndrome, so there's still a huge amount of research into actually what causes it. Um, you know, you've had all these theories, but uh, I promise you it's a syndrome. There's uh, millions of causes in, 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 with, 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 the, with the normal gastric torsion. And remember, when a, when a stomach turns over, the other thing that gets um, compromised is the spleen. So the spleen blood vessels can also close off as well as the stomach blood vessels, so you may get the dog to either rupture stomach or even lose its spleen as well. But please, you need to also phone your vet, okay? Because sitting at a door waiting for your vet to arrive in 20 minutes is also um, a really big thing. And the only way that we can see whether um, it's a dinkum twist is that on the X, or after you've x-rayed the dog's abdomen, you'll see it looks just like a boxing glove. The stomach makes a, 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 a pure boxing glove inside of air, and then you know that it actually has torsed. It isn't just just bloated, okay? But unfortunately, guys, with that, you can do nothing besides get the dog in the car and get help as soon as possible. In the olden days, you know, the farmer would put a needle into the side of the stomach, um, but I don't think any of you are gonna have to be brave enough to do that, okay? And it's, yeah, you, you will get the air out, but it will carry on, it'll carry on forming, okay? Um, while William's lying like this, just for you to remember, if you have a dog that's been knocked over, um, it's really important for you to remember is that, uh, obviously, once again, remember I the dog is in shock, okay? And he loves me to bits, but if his leg is broken and I touch his leg, he's going to bite me and he's allowed to bite me, okay? So you do need to remember, just get a soft piece of bandage and bandage his muzzle, okay? You all know how to muzzle dogs, I'm sure. You all know, tied around the muzzle, behind the ears, and then that's tied, okay? So when a dog's been involved in a, in an, uh, a motor car accident or a dog fight, which is really, really awful, just remember, until you can actually see the dog recognizing you, try not to touch them that they can bite you. Because I see, I feel so sorry for some dogs. They bite their owners completely to smithereens, and then they like look and go, "Oh shit, it's you!" Okay, because they're in a state of shock. It really is. So you know, you can speak to them. You don't have to touch them. If you really, really sore, and your brain is in a complete overload of pain, you, you you're not thinking clearly, and they're not thinking clearly. So until they get to the stage that their body's trying to compensate for that pain and they actually start recognizing you, don't touch them because even if he's got a front sore front leg and if he's in that acute sense of pain, if I touch his back leg, he's going to scream. Okay, so just speak to them, let them look at you, let them recognize you, tie their mouths if necessary. And then um, obviously if a leg's just doing this, you guys, when you want to transport it, you need to try your hardest to stabilize that leg. But it's absolutely no use putting a bandage on a leg unless you can stabilize the joint above the supposed break and the joint below the supposed break. Because if this dog's got a broken leg here and I put a bandage on there, okay, just above the break to there, all I'm doing is making that, that break even worse because I'm putting weight below. So then the, the, the fracture is going to do this, okay? So I would have to include his elbow, try and straighten his elbow out, and make sure that the, whatever bone is broken is in as straight a position as possible. Please don't try and straighten it, okay? Just as straight a position as possible that you prevent the leg doing this and hitting against things because that really is not pleasant for them. Um, you know, so like if a dog's humerus is broken, that's really difficult to stabilize, okay? Um, so basically below the elbow down, you would want to try and stabilize them before you move them, okay? Um, and then when you are stabilizing them, remember um, any wound that's bleeding, 
you don't want to put anything like cotton wool or soft band or anything directly onto that wound. Because what happens when we try and take it off, that's all inside that wound and it's impossible to get rid of cotton wool and stuff. Even gauze, this, if I put a, this is better than nothing though, eh? So, but even a gauze bandage like that, with these little weaves, the blood and stuff gets inside there, and then when you take it off, you're ripping the whole thing off again. But at least none of this stays behind, okay? Simple things like, um, obviously, putting an ointment on, that you've got a layer between whatever you're putting on and, 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 and the, the, the wound. Um, we find Kimbies work tremendously. What's that, my boy? <laughs> okay. Um, this, this little part here of this, only time I'll ever use Kimbies, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but this part here is really, really nice because it absorbs blood and, and all the plasma and everything that's going to be, it, it's going to be released by the wound and it takes it away from the wound and when you remove it, it doesn't stick to the wound. So a, a piece of a Kimby really does work very, very nicely. Okay. Um, and then obviously, when your dog has been knocked over by a car or bitten by another dog, and a, a very common thing when, when a large breed dog bites a small breed dog is what we call a flail chest. So a flail chest is a hole in the chest that goes from the extra space, okay, into the outside. So when the dog tries to breathe, the air comes directly into the outside of his lungs, which is really, really serious. The lung will collapse and it's not getting air in. But your most important thing for first aid is to close that hole. Because you need to let the dog have negative pressure inside his chest cavity. So once again, when you close that hole, you would use a massive wad of, of, of swabs. You would use a massive piece of cotton wool, wrap it entirely around the chest, okay, please. And then when you do bandage anything, I don't know, do any of you guys use this flexor support stuff? Please, guys, you have to unroll it first before you use it, okay? Because this stretchiness is unbelievable. You will think you've got it on just nicely. Um, meantime, in three, four minutes time, it just starts contracting. Um, and even a foot bandage, a chest bandage, roll it out first and then use it. Okay, um, and it's cool, you need to use a, a little bit of pressure, but if you look at that, if I'm gonna use it like that, it's gonna, come, gonna pull back to that. So that's a huge amount of pressure that you're putting on. Um, so th just be very aware of these. Um, humans apparently are stopping using this now because of, of that problem of, of them um, cutting off blood supply and everything else. Um, so your normal crepe bandage is cool, but you have to try and seal that hole through layers, and then obviously your dog would then be transported. Okay, um, with with um, just simple bleeding. I mean, we have people coming in there and they have their lani lani cars and there's blood everywhere because the dog cut its foot. If you have nothing, get a packet and put it over the bleeding appendage. It really is a bit better to have the blood inside a packet than you know, inside your car and all over your, all over your furniture. Because dog's feet bleed amazingly, okay? So put it over a packet, and if you just put, um, if you just put, a, even, you know, if, if you haven't got anything, put a piece of sellotape around it, or tie it, masking tape, whatever, or tie it, and then <coughs> the dog can go to um, have whatever needs to be repaired. Okay, um, and then while we're talking about bandages, if I, you know how, you know how the, the blood works, the blood comes through in the arteries down to the leg, and then it goes back in the veins. So obviously the arteries have got the heart as a pump behind it, so there's quite a lot of pressure in the arteries, but the vein just goes through normal drainage, okay? So when you put a bandage on any animal, you need to always bandage from the furthest extremity, towards the main part of the body, okay? Because if you're gonna put a bandage on his foot and you start tightening the bandage from here down, all you're doing is you're keeping all the blood in his toes, okay? And then if, you, if you're bandaging a broken leg here, you have to always include all the extremities because once again, if I just put a bandage from there to there, that blood's gonna go down here, perfectly and then coming back 
this way. Okay, cool, thanks. Coming back this way, it's going to sit, and then you're going to have a massive edematous foot with blood in all over. How am I doing for time, boss? All right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so those are the main, the main emergency things. One of the, the nice things also are splints for bandaging. It really does help a lot to have a splint available to bandage a broken leg. Um, it definitely helps that. And then these kind of things, for those of you who are actually in practice, um, this kind of micropore is really lovely for you to put this dressing on where you would like it to actually be. Those of you who do practice, because you can now put little strips to keep it where it should be, because often you take a bandage off and that thing was put there originally, and when you carry on bandaging, it lands up down here somewhere. So just put it on there. Obviously, don't, don't put it on tight with these things, but that just keeps it in the position that you need it to be in. All right. Um, and as a general rule, I think a little bandage um, a little bandage box in your cars, wherever you go, if you, if you have your pets with you, is a good idea. So you would, need, um, you would need some kind of ointment, just a basic ointment, please. You would need some kind of dressing. You would need either soft band or cotton wool. You'd need the next layer of your gauze, okay, your bandaging, and then you'd need the next layer of that. I mean, I think that's just a basic first aid kit because what else are you going to take along? That's, that's what you really need uh, as, as far as I can see. Okay. Um, the reason we normally put um, the cotton wool as a large bandage is because when dogs bite, they don't normally just bite in one area. So we're just covering the rest because often you get um, emphysema, which is the, the, the air under the skin, and the dog feels like um, those those poppy things. <laughs> so if you put a bandage, and you don't want to stop them breathing, hey, that really is important, you know, what you say is, and then you're just trying to stop that air moving under the skin to, to anywhere else, um, because it, it does, it sits there and the dog blows up like a ball. Yes? Unfortunately, remember I said to you, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a syndrome. Um, so they are even reckoning um, there's certain breeds of dogs. Obviously, we all know because they're deep-chested dogs, but there's certain lines in breeds of dogs. Um, there's a vet in, in Natal that's doing a whole um, research on a line of um, Ridgebacks, and it's amazing. I don't think, I think he said every single one of the, the entire line has had a gastric torsion before. So... You remember they went through that whole stage of saying, oh, you mustn't feed your dog high up, you mustn't feed the dog low down, you mustn't feed the dog, you mustn't exercise it after eating. It's a huge thing, but, you know, it happens like at 2 o'clock in the morning. Why? I don't know. And it happens to any dog that's going to have a deep chest, okay? Um, it definitely happens to dogs who are anxious, without a doubt, more, more so than a, than a calm dog. Um, and it's, it, it, it is less likely to happen if the dog is eating a food that they eat less of. So they, in other words, their stomachs aren't full. Um, so that's really what it is. And it's, it's continual research. You know, we even, um, with, with, with the dogs that are huge, hugely predisposed to it, we're even um, suggesting that they do gastropexies in, when they sterilize the animal. And gastropexy is you tie the stomach to the body wall, the side of the stomach. So the stomach is sitting, and if it tries to turn, then the, this, the, 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 it's actually attached to the side of the wall. Um, you just don't want to. You just don't want to use anything with cortisone onto a raw wound. That's all. Um, but even if you use cortisone while you took the dog to the vet, it's going to do no harm. Okay, so it's just the continual application. It's better to have something on the wound. And um, what we actually often use now is just sterile water on a swab if the, on, on, a, on a clean wound. Um, so you just don't want dry onto, onto that. And that's all it is. So it's wet onto wet. That's basically what you want to try and do. At home, a lot of people um, want to start treating ears by themselves and eyes by themselves. So, with an eye, um, obviously, when you open a dog's eye, you need to make sure that your hands are actually on the dog's head, okay? Because if your hands are away, you're going to you're going to 
maybe hurt the dog's eye. So you want to be on the head. Both um, thumbs will be the easiest thing to open the eye. And then you're going to open the eye to look in and above and around. Okay? Because if you've got an eye infection, you need to make sure that it's not actually... It's right, boy. It's okay. You're going to get off there now. Wait a bit. Wait a bit. Hey, good boy. So you're not going to... Um, you must make sure there's no foreign body in the eye, okay? And then please, I don't know where the salt water comes to clean things. I love mopsticks. Please just use ordinary water with a piece of cotton wool and then you can just clean um, the, the, your doggy's eye and you would normally just clean from there through this canthus and down. That's all you're going to do. Um, and when, you, when you're looking in the dog's eye, it's really important to look down in that area. Okay, there. That's where the foreign bodies are going to go to. Um, grass seeds and all those kind of things. Even a little seed will go in there. With, not even a big grass seed will go in there. And please, under no circumstances can you ever use any eye ointment that's got cortisone in it. Unless the vet has done um, a fluorescein test to check that the dog hasn't got an ulcer. Okay. And an ulcer in an eye can develop just because of stress. Okay. And you will not see an ulcer. So an ulcer is just a little erosion of the, the, the tissue of the eye. And if you put cortisone drops in there, <coughs> that eye will burst. And then you lose it. Okay. So it is a very serious thing. Okay, so please rather just use something like RC, use eye drops if you need to, but they must not have cortisone in. Remember, a lot of the ones that you use for um, uh, allergies and that will have cortisone in. That's what the cortisone does. So please don't use it in your dog's eyes. And then please, ears. We have so many people coming in and they've treated their ears at home, okay? So number one with ears as well, remember foreign bodies are a very, very common thing in, in dog's ears. And then that is actually an, an infection caused by the foreign body, not an infection because of the ear, okay? So yes, you can use things like epiotic or clean ear, whatever, to clean the dog's ear out with the greatest of pleasure. But please remember, we do need to get an otoscope. We do need to look down into a dog's ear because the ear canal does this, okay? Um, and we need to look and see as well whether the eardrum is there or not because the ointment that you put in needs to either be this ointment or that ointment according to whether the dog's eardrum is intact or not, okay? Um, so please don't just hoi. And remember, what your dog infection your dog had last time may not be the same as it has this time. So I'm not trying to make you run to the vet every second, but just understand the problems. And also, one of the things that I do, that you can all shout at me for, your dog has an ear infection and I put the drops in until it stops looking like it's bad. You need to finish them. You need to do another little smear to see that the, whatever you were trying to kill, the bacteria or the yeast are gone, and then you can stop. Because that's why your ear infections carry on for so long, because we don't finish the quarters of the course properly, and we don't check up that whatever we're treating is finished. Yeah, everybody's got controversy. So I, had, I grew up with poodles, and um, the one poodle, I didn't take the hair out of his ears for six months, and had such a bad infection, it was ridiculous. And what we get is we... When they come to us, that hair has accumulated all the guck that, that, is, that is put out by, so it looks like a raster inside the ear. So we do pull it out, hey? Um, we just make sure the ear canal is open. Um, it's not sore if you do it properly. It's probably a little bit sore. Like, you, I don't know, do you pluck your eyebrows or whatever else? The same. But what you do is you, you get one or two little ones and you get it on a, on a little forceps and you twist them. You mustn't pull it. You just twist them and then they come out one at a time and then it's not so sore. Okay, but normally, <laughs> normally the parlors will do it for you. Whew, I'm so glad I've run out of time. <laughs> All right. He's a good boy. He's a my boy. He's a good boy.